Welcome to another episode of Turf Dog Down Under. I'm Stasia and this is Ange. Hi. Hi, Hi. everyone. Hi, Stas. Well, interesting week for us. Uh, mm. We had our first ever video be taken down by YouTube last week. For reasons that weren't substantiated. Uh, yeah, the message I received from from YouTube was uh, it was due to a defamation complaint. Mm. Defamation. Now, you and I both know which man is responsible for this. The chest feeding man. That's the one. And his cronies. Um, so... It was removed for viewing in Australia, but the rest of the world can still watch it. Um, so what I did, I edited last week's video and took out the roughly 10 minutes where we were talking about men who breastfeed and um, re-uploaded that to YouTube. And we now have an Odyssey account as well, Ange. Um, uh, so I've uploaded the censored portion to Odyssey for now. And even over there, we're getting we've we've got like shitty comments from a woman called Natasha Buckley. Oh, so she is the breastfeeding man's sister. Mm. She also messaged our page, and I, I'm going to read this out. Um, so you think it's okay to post articles and slander all over media stuff about my family and my sister how dare you post something without the facts how dare you say my nephew was sexual abused how dare you it's disgusting you think it's okay to destroy my sister's life do you nor know I don't, do you not know the damage you have done the bullying beware if anything happens to my sister I will sue you well everything we discussed was in an article that was published and went all over the world. Now, we didn't have any insider information. We discussed the information that was already provided. One, we didn't do any, anything defamatory. You yeah. know, we're allowed to, there's a big difference between defamation and disagreeing with content. Everybody is allowed to disagree. And it is an opinion yeah. that, that is sexual abuse. And if 10 years ago, Everyone would have said that was sexual abuse. But because this gender identity is, is cool, um, you know, now they're, they're throwing in that it isn't. But it is. I certainly think it is. Um, that, that's a hill we're both prepared to die on too. So if, if you know, you're so outraged that um, a, a bloke putting a newborn baby to his breast and feeding an unknown substance to that baby to gratify his own lactation fetish. If you think that's okay, that's good for you, but we don't. Yeah. Um, just the content of that message that she sent, um, it's so over the top. It's hyperbole. We see it all the time from these people. And um I've I've been watching this this guy on YouTube. Um, he, he was featured. He did an interview on Trigonometry a few weeks ago. His name's Josh Slocum. He's a gay man in his forties, um, and he approaches the whole social justice movement um, through the lens of um, these people have serious personality disorders. Mm -hmm. And that's what we see, um, that, and that's exactly what happened last week with, with um, these trans activists coming after us. Like that message that, that the, Natasha Buckley sent the page, um, it, it's just so over the top. It's I'm a victim, I'm a victim, I'm a victim. That's a personality disorder. Um, you, you can't tell the world I'm a breastfeeding man, I did this to my infant son and not expect people to go, that's fucking gross. Yeah. How divorced from reality does one have to be? And this whole threat of um, if anything happens to my sister, I'm going to sue you. 
It's like how the how on earth are we responsible for what happens to your sister? Okay, you you put your face out there. You put photos of yourself breastfeeding and a, a, a baby, and and you expect no pushback. Like that's insane. He's been boasting about um, feeding his own child all over social media for four years. The whole world knows anyway. You know, I've been having discussions with him for years. So, you know, framing this as us setting him up for, you know, other people to attack him, I've not heard any threats towards him. Yeah, I've not made them. You haven't made them. Nobody else we know has. But yet we get threats every single day because we stand up against this ideology. So I wonder if if she's imagining that he's going to commit suicide over this, I don't know. Um, which again is is telltale sign of of um, a personality disorder. It's manipulative. Yeah, all of this, all this, the talk, the threat, the threatening nature of their talk is manipulative. And there's a lot of theories about why there seems to be an increase in um, narcissistic disorders, and it's all linked to um, social media is breeding them. It really is. Yeah. 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 It gives people who didn't wouldn't have you know that person that you were awkward about in the street that didn't have a public profile that you could just avoid is now in your lounge room via social media. Mm. It's given people an audience they wouldn't have had and it's given healthy people an audience and it's given unhealthy people an audience. Mm. And the unhealthy people, it's messing with their heads Mm. and they're believing the things that they tell them on social media. And we've noticed that to a degree with, you know, girls and and body issues and even young men and body issues. You know, that's a a similar kind of thing. But when it comes to disordered behaviour, that is like, you know, throwing petrol on a fire, the whole way that social media is structured um, towards validation and kindness Mm -hmm. and virtue signalling. There's also the the victim mentality. Um, I, I call that covert narcissism. It is. It, um, yeah. So it's it's this form of narcissism where, oh, poor me, the whole world is against me and, oh, this person did this terrible thing to me. Um, and men with autogynephilia have that in spades. Mm. Right? And, and there's also a fashion to um, li- list all your private, like, you know, personality disorders or your, um, you know, diagnoses or, you know, to sort of frame yourself as a as the biggest victim. It's like a, 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 an oppression Olympics, yeah. just individually between people and also culturally. It's like, oh, you know, like the, the trope of the, um, what is it, the trans black woman being the most marginalised person on earth and things like that, where, you know, it's the white middle-aged heterosexual man who is exploiting the concept of the trans black woman in order to further his own agenda. So there's a lot of that stuff going on too that, you know, and I, you know, if I, if the person that tried to kick me out of a domestic violence group that I was in from the foundation, you know, the first thing they introduce themselves with is that I'm a pansexual non-binary trans person with autism and ADHD who is you know blah 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 and went through this whole thing so I'm just sitting there going what am I supposed to do you know like say uh you know identify as something no you know I'm just gonna stand my ground and say okay you know go ahead but I felt um I felt that she was trying to frame herself as this this you know, victim that I was somehow attacking when I wasn't. I hadn't said a word to the person and she was welcome in the group, even though it was a group for women and mothers. Mm. So until she did all that, now she's not so welcome. Mm, mm, mm. Um, crazy times, crazy. Yeah. So, look, we, we gained um, 70 new subscribers overnight Ooh. and this was, after I, <laughs> this was after I posted a link on an article by the Mercury that was essentially a smear piece against me. But we'll talk about that a little bit later with our guest. Um, we've got Isla McGregor coming on. Um, so I, I thought it might be a good opportunity to I- I- explain what autogynephilia is, why you and I and so many other women object to these sorts of men coming into our spaces and, um, you, you know, doing woman face, wearing our skins, so to speak. Um, 
and, and you know, maybe maybe we can expand beyond that. But so for those who don't know, Dr. Ray Blanchard was a sexologist who worked with um, transsexuals and want to be transsexuals uh, back in the 90s. And um, in working with them, he was able to distinguish that there are two very distinct types of men who present, uh, who pursue um, transition. Um, one type he called the homosexual transsexuals. Mm -hmm. So these are gay men that are very effeminate, have been very effeminate since they were small children, suffered gender dysphoria in their early childhood, and it persisted through their teens. And so and in order to gain some sort of resolution and get on with their lives in adulthood, they transition. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, I personally think that there's a lot of internalised homophobia going on for those men, which is really sad. Um, I, I, I have a lot of compassion for that type. And I even have a little bit of compassion for some of the men who have autogynophilia. So the other typology that Ray Blanchard discovered was... Um, he he came up with the word autogynophilia, which means love of oneself as a woman. These men are, and, you know, I've watched him talk about it and I'm, it is just seared into my memory. And he says it so casually. Um, these men, they start out by wearing women's underwear, watching themselves in a mirror, masturbating. Mm -hmm. That is how it starts. He said every single time they will deny it they will probably deny it in therapy for months on end and you keep digging keep digging and eventually they'll admit that is where it started so it's this erotic fixation on themselves which is like the parallels with narcissism is undeniable to be sexually attracted to yourself as and a woman we also know that with pornography being so prolific now that the rate of autogynophilia is going up because men are actually discovering that fetish through pornography as they search for something that gives them arousal so they start off with the vanilla stuff and then they work their way around the online world and you know find find this trans porn and go oh that's my new kink and then once they're in it kind of feeds itself yep. and that's how they they decide oh I am a woman you know I am one I'm actually going to post a couple of links in the description if you want to check out Genevieve Gluck from mm. the US has done extensive research into into this um she's been on the YouTube show whose body is it and she's presented what she's found um, the the one of the genres sissy hypno porn mm. like warning don't look at it but if you want to check it out um, just do go to Pornhub type in sissy hypno porn you'll get hun thousands and thousands of results probably millions I don't know um, and 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 this is like subliminal programming telling men who are watching this that you're a sissy you are going to enjoy being fucked like a woman blah 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 they use hypnotic like flashing stuff and, and anime and a lot of young particularly anime. autistic boys are groomed into this ideology through anime and it starts off innocent and winds up down the porn rabbit hole and i know boys now who have got introduced to some horrific concepts through anime porn and hypno sissy porn is one of them yep forced feminization it's another yep. genre you can look up no, but no, Gen no. Yeah. Oh, jennifer going, does a really good job so check out her videos yeah. yeah i'm going back a bit too you know we all knew before trans was the coolest thing that um you know dressing up as a woman uh is is a known paraphilia for people who have um sexual deviancies serial killers um flashes you know, a lot of people that are convicted of violent sex crimes, when they undergo um, forensic analysis, 
It is found that they enjoy wearing women's clothing or keeping women's clothing or stealing women's clothing or wearing their wife's underpants. So it is a known paraphilia. And just because men now identify as trans doesn't mean that that link doesn't exist. We, we expect it to pretend all the time that all of the past studies in the past history just don't matter anymore. And that self-identification is um, resolves like absolves men from all of the sick shit that they've been doing for hundreds of years. All of a sudden, you know, if they self-identify as a woman, then that stuff doesn't exist, and that does not make sense. Yeah, I mean, it used to be called transvestic um, fetishism, yeah. for God's yeah. sake. It was well yeah. established over the last 50, 60 years that this is a fetish, and. Um, mm -hmm. Um, Ray Blanchard went one further and said it's a paraphilia. It is. A paraphilia is this sexual obsession that takes over a, a man's life to the point where he can't function without this, this fetish going on in the background. Mm -hmm. um, so it takes many forms. Um, for some men, it's simply cross-dressing and that's where it ends. For other men, it becomes I need to have a woman's body he'll go on hormones and grow breasts usually doesn't get his um, penis chopped off but sometimes does um, these are heterosexual men that is the telltale sign they are still attracted look they need a willing participant to enact out, out their sexual fantasies of being a woman um, so they do enter into relationships with women. They call themselves lesbians. I mean, it's, it's really fucked up. Um, it, and if you can't see this, you are so naive. You are so incredibly naive and stupid, willfully and ignorant. Yeah. And the difference between the homosexual transsexual is he's not demanding that women sleep with him. He's usually not demanding women accept him in women-only spaces because for him to go into a woman-only space and hear women discussing their bodies or their experiences would cause deep dysphoria for him. Mm -hmm. He wouldn't get off on it. A homosexual transsexual would not get off on it. An autogynophile would find it validating. Mm -hmm. That's the difference. I, you know, I, I lived with... with um, transgender, trans, you know, identified men. I live with two of them and their names were Craig and, Jen and Jason, mm. Mm. you know, and they went to work every day dressed as a woman. They never said they were women. Mm. And one of them went on to have surgery and whatever. I don't know if he changed his name to Jasmine or whatever, but there was never, you know, there was that, never that demand to break through at my boundaries or our boundaries or our, you know, there was always asking permission to yeah. go into the women's room you know with us or whatever there was none of this and with the autogynophiles there's there's they just don't care they just barge on in mm -hmm. now I, in hindsight I would say no and say no you can't come in here you're a man but back then the the amount of trans people was so minute it had barely any impact on us Whereas now more and more and more and more people are identifying as trans and I'm encountering men more often in women only spaces. Now I live in a semi rural area. What's it like for people in the inner city? I had someone contact me during the week and say that they and their daughter were in the female change rooms at I think the Brunswick pool or something like that. And a trans identifying bloke was brushing his hair. With so, no clothes on, with his dick out. When that happens, you have to put in a complaint. Mm. Anyone listening, you have to complain to the establishment. If it is a council-owned establishment, complain to the council. Report it to the police for indecent exposure. Um, I, I, I just wanted to expand a little bit more Um so then you've on on what is autogynophilia so we've gone through cross-dressing um growing breasts but then 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 it becomes really icky there are men who fetishize the idea of having female bodily functions like menstruation yeah. pregnancy lactation um one of the most disgusting 
things I I read uh, is is these men sharing period recipes. So they mix together tomato sauce and all this other shit and stick it up their ass and put a tampon up there and pretend that they're a woman. See, we get criticised all the, all the time, you know, about not educating ourselves. This is the thing. You don't have to go far to see this stuff. We're not making it up. We've just been on the internet for a couple of years talking about this stuff. These men are openly doing this on Facebook, Twitter, Reddit, you name it. They're openly talking about this stuff and they're also insisting we don't use sex-based language to describe ourselves, yet they can talk about their tomato sauce period as much as they want. Another incredibly disgusting one was um, a couple of women sharing a house with a trans woman. woman. Um, one of the women, she couldn't find something and the trans woman was out of the house. She went into his room to see if, if it was in there and she discovered a cup, a coffee cup, with used tampons in it, <laughs> this man had the bright idea that um, because he couldn't afford to purchase estrogen hormones to grow his breasts, that if he if he used these tampons as a, in a tea format, <laughs> that he would get a little bit of estrogen out of them. So people will say you're making that up, but no, nah, this is true. This is the sort of stuff they do, these fetishists. This woman was describing it, saying, I felt, like, and what a violation. Mm. They steal tampons out of public toilets too. Yep, yep. I, I've, I've read accounts, a really sick account of a, a man going into, um, it was like a, a service station or something like that, and he's gone in to use the toilets and he's looked through the waste bin and found a used pad, fastened it to his underwear, walked back out and looks at the woman behind the counter. And he's describing this whole thing in his little story saying, um, oh, I knew it was hers. And, I, and it delighted me that it was her pad that I was wearing. Like, it's fucking sick. You know they're in mid uh, in um, miscarriage and stillbirth groups too. Like it's just such a violation. This whole movement is a, is about violating women, humiliating women, and fucking idiot women. I'm sorry, out there are allowing it to happen and are going along with it. And I, I, I mean the the ones that are trans activists. I'm so angry at those women. They're betrayers. Mm. and they're not the women that are ever going to really have to encounter these people they're not the women that are in jail or in in rehabs or in domestic violence services these are usually middle class women or blue ticks on twitter or you know people who have private health cover you know the women the, the women who are most impacted by this ideology um, aren't the ones that are saying you know, trans women are women yeah we know what a woman is. Um, sorry, I've just received a text message from our guest who oh. can't seem to access <laughs> Zoom. Um, sorry, I'm just going to have to send her. See, the media, you know, is determined that people don't realise what an autogynophile is. They never make the distinction between a transsexual and autogynophile. Um, yeah. They don't want people to know. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And, that, 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 you know, this is why they're... they're the people like um, the serial killer, Paul Denyer, um, he's up for parole soon. And, you know, I've I mentioned something about that on Twitter and I've had people come and correct me for calling him him and Paul because he now identifies as a trans woman in prison. Now, he killed women. He's raped prisoners. He is a danger to society and every cop and everyone else who's involved with him thinks that he shows no remorse and should never be released and I'm getting policed on his pronouns because trans activists don't want anyone to imagine that self-ID is rife for abuse by predatory men because if you admit one man will abuse self-ID legislation for their own benefit then you have to admit that they all will 
so they won't allow it. I mean, look, just as a minimum, if you're a fucking serial killer or a serial rapist, you shouldn't be allowed to identify, to to legally change your sex to female. But what about domestic violence perps? Half of the um, the trans identifying blokes that are in the public eye have got recent charges for domestic violence. It seems to be a trigger point for them to transition. Sorry, what was that? Sorry, I had oh, to send a message. DV perps. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. Sickening, absolutely mm. sickening. Um, and all their crimes are always forgotten. You know, a guy can do whatever he wants and the second, kill people, and the second that he identifies as a woman, his pronouns are more important than the impact of calling a man a woman on his victims or any other woman. Which is exactly the joke that Ricky Gervais made. Yep. <laughs> he's just Good on him. He's just it's funny because it's true. Mm. And it's but it's not funny when it's the police and the legal system forcing, you know, victims of rapists to call their rapists female. Mm. And it's not funny when the police are looking for missing people and calling them the wrong sex. And that they're, you know, like it's just it's it's terrifying. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, did you find our guest? Yes, yeah, she's in the waiting room. Let's bring Ooh, her. Is. Cool. So we have Isla McGregor from Hobart, Tasmania, joining us again. Um, she was on the show. I can't remember if it was late last year or early mm. this year. There's a lot happening in Tasmania. There is. Hi, oh, Isla. Is. Can you hear us? We can't hear you. You have we can to see you. Turn your audio on, please. Oh, no, now we've lost your video. <laughs> um, yeah, there has been a bit happening in Tasmania. Um, <clears throat> the Tasmanian Law Reform Institute is, you know, rec recommending a ban on conversion therapy for people with gender identities. Mm. Um, just your audio, um, Isla, can't hear you. I've just asked you to unmute. Yeah, I've done that. You can there hear you me are. Now. Yes, hi, how are you? Welcome back. Okay, sorry for the delay. That's, That's all right. right. Mm. So tell us what's, what's happening in Hobart. Okay, well, there's a few things. Um, we we've uh, recently had some publicity in the media about the trans flag being raised outside the town hall yes i saw that yes mm -hmm. um uh, we had a, a, a very professional write-up done by the australian journalist matthew denham uh in the papers on tuesday uh, and on Wednesday, um, Kenji Sato, the Mercury um, gossip columnist, a cadet journalist, um, has written yet another piece of, uh, you know, fluffy, you know, character assassination. <laughs> um, <Me>. So, <laughs> yes, um, it's extraordinary how um, Kenji Sato um, has this long-term track record of... Um, misreporting, uh, false reporting, uh, not doing the normal sort of procedures that journalists do by ringing up people concerned uh, or with allegations made against them in, in relation to particularly the trans flag issue. So um, yes, he used it as, as yet another opportunity to uh, target feminists um, and to detract from uh, the perpetrators in this issue. I mean, what's so interesting about Kenji's reporting is it models uh, the DAVO um, yeah. principle mm. in many respects. Yeah. And um, so can what you, he's got... Can you just explain DAVO for people who don't know? I might have to get you to do that. I've forgotten <laughs> the, the precise words. Um, so it, it, it's, it's used by narcissistic abusers quite frequently. Um, it stands for deny attack, reverse victim and offender, D 
Davo. So yeah, he very much did um, do the reversal, the narcissistic reversal on, on in in this article. Um, he went after me mm-hmm. when the person at fault was the Lord Mayor. Mm-hmm. Um, he, he, he didn't go after the Lord Mayor because he agrees with her. But, um, you know, we were the ones, the Coalition for Biological Reality, we were the victims of some really bad actions by the Lord Mayor. Um, she put the, she ordered the trans flags to be flown out the front of the um, Hobart Town Hall when we held our gender identity in law forum back in February. We were the victims there. And that whole fucking article, he just reversed it and made me, very much me, the abuser Mm -hmm. because I used swear words on turf talk. I think the interesting thing is, regardless of the allegations against the Lord Mayor, the fact is that uh, two uh, questions without notice to council um, straight after the coalition's forum uh, failed to actually get a, a, a... what I would call an honest and definitive answer to the question, who instructed um, uh, the staff at council to raise these flags. Now we've got three stat decks that have been submitted. I won't go into further detail about the code of conduct complaints due to legal and privacy reasons, Um, but uh, there are potentially more stat decks forthcoming. Um, But I think what's so unfortunate um, about this is that uh, In Kenji's reporting after the forum, uh, yet again, he uses that slurless uh, term, um, uh, anti-trans activists. Um, And and also he failed to mention that uh, Anna Reynolds was one of a triumvirate of women who had actually tried to ban this public interest forum from going ahead. Now, normally journalists, uh, are going to be like a rat up a drain pipe with mm. such a major free speech issue as this. And I think it's indicative, particularly across Australia, that, you know, that journalists are, are under such enormous threat and pressure from the trans rights lobby and their editors, and of course, membership from ACON, to actually report uh, fairly and impartially on these issues. I'm really pleased to see that more and more journalists are becoming aware of this. Mm. Um, But um, Kenji Sato has currently got uh, numerous complaints uh, going to the new editor of the Mercury, uh, Craig Warhurst, uh, about his conduct, which the previous acting editor uh, appears to have taken no action uh, on Kenji's um, unprofessional and very, very uh, vindictive and sloppy reporting. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think he really enjoys it. Um, he, he enjoys enacting reputational damage, as, as specific, especially against women. Yeah, I, I, I would have a different perspective on that, Starship, because from the Facebook comments this week on his posting, uh, it was a different posting on Facebook, of course. Um, uh, most of the comments were actually very damning of Kenji's reporting and supportive of free speech. So whereas I think he would like to think he's acting on, uh, you know, entrenching reputational damage on uh, women's rights activists, um, I think the national profile of cases like Kath Deves, um, the sporting issue, JK Rowling, uh, are really coming home to roost in the Tis- Tasmanian and national, you know, mind. Mm-hmm. So I think the thing is that the, the, the TRA lobby um, are ramping up their uh, attacks on us and their campaign because they know the Australian community are actually gaining, gaining uh, you know, traction about understanding uh, these issues and how they're affecting all sectors of the community, but most importantly, the mental health of children. Yeah. Mm. Um, speaking of children, do you- did you want to fill us in quickly on um, the Tasmanian Law Reform Institute's report? Yes, um, we we understand that the um, Premier, who has been um, lobbied by a number of people um, 
from our perspective on these issues, particularly in relation to trans child medicine. Um, had made an announcement earlier this week that he will push ahead with this, um, uh, this uh, legislative proposal for uh, anti-conversion laws. The proposal by the TAS Law Reform Institute basically suggests that the Tasmanian chief civil psychiatrist in collaboration with numerous health organisations develops a guideline for health practitioners. Um, now, this is an easy way of handballing the controversial aspect of this legislation to the chief civil psychiatrist, and he has my deepest sympathies, I can tell you, um, because it is going to be a bum fight big time uh, in, in, in his department. Um, fortunately, we've got the uh, National Association of Practicing Psychiatrists um, absolutely magnificent gender guideline, which is the first um, careful cautious, compassionate guideline for the treatment of children struggling with gender dysphoria. And the ANZPC are, um, are supportive of that approach, as well, I think, the AMA in Tasmania in their submission to the Law Reform Institute uh, uh, discussion paper, um, they actually referenced the AMA Brisbane paper and they're very cautious about the fact that uh, health professionals do not lose the ability uh, to conduct um, treatment and uh, health practices ethically for children looking particularly at comorbidities. Mm. Um, I think what's concerning about the Premier in Tasmania is that he's understood to have a very autocratic style, that he doesn't consult with his cabinet, um, I think this is very alarming. We do know that uh, the rank and file of the Liberal Party uh, voted at a state council meeting two years ago to roll back gender identity law reforms, um, but the Parliamentary Party are completely ignoring this. I think what's most concerning about the TAS Law Reform Institute's report, which is an in indicative of the type of mentality of um, the authors of this report was that in the section uh, titled Conscientious Objection, um, they raise the idea that uh, on the basis of moral, philosophical or religious beliefs that uh, health professionals um, can be registered as conscientious objectors, mm. in, obviously in a database held by the government, which is tantamount to a blacklist. Yeah. Now, this is just such an indicator of the mindset of the Law Reform Institute and the authors that instead of suggesting um, a preferred providers list be kept by the government so that people can ring up and say, oh, who do I see? I live in Glenorchy, I live in Kingston or Burnie. What they've now got is a blacklist. Now, I think that that is a real worry. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I thought that bit was particularly outrageous. It mm. leaves them vulnerable to um, uh, trans activists setting them up. Absolutely. I mm. mean, the law report does provide um, in a very brief section some lip service to uh, a token reassurance that uh, you know the right to discuss and debate issues relating uh, gender identity in particular will not be impacted by this because obviously most of the submissions that they initially got uh, were uh, uh, submissions that were cautioning against this type of legislation to do with gender identity only. I'll clarify that. Um, but I think what's really interesting about the Law Reform Institute process, which needs to be exposed here, is that there were very few submissions from the TRA side mm. um, timed for the deadline of submissions for the report, which was meant to be, I think, the 7th of January 2020. Um, after that, what, what miraculously happened was uh, an online survey um, about uh, conversion practices in Tasmania to which 823 people submitted, of mm. course, which was then uh, able to be inserted into the TLRI report. 
none of the gender critical submissions from organisations such as uh, the Coalition Women Speak Tasmania, uh, IWD Mianjin, uh, Feminist Legal Clinic and a lot of uh, health organisations actually got mentioned by name in the report. So our, our organisational uh, existence was in fact erased from the contents of the report, yet again, which is indicative. That's what happened in Victoria and in New Zealand. And as you know, here in Victoria now that the laws have been implemented, GPs just automatically handle people at first visit to gender clinics because they just don't want to deal with it. Yeah. And all well, the gender clinics are affirmation. So, yeah. Look, I think there's a lot of objection to the affirmation only approach mm -hmm. um, in Tasmania. I think that's very clear. Um, from the AMA in Tasmania. Um, and I think from my own understanding of mental health professionals here, um, you know, there's a lot of grave concern that uh, basically, you know, if we, don't, if we don't actually get national reform and national guidelines, we're going to have this disparity between the states and, uh, you know, the, the TRA lobby uh, going to continue pushing hard on this. So I certainly hope that the chief civil psychiatrist uh, does uh, consult widely, including with Jenny King from the um, Active Watchful Waiting uh, Australasia Network. Um, she's based in Hobart. So, you know, a broad, wide ranging consultation will be necessary. Um, just going back to that that survey that you mentioned that miraculously made it into the report. Um, so this is a self-reporting survey. So it, it's not good science. The methodology is bullshit, right? Yes, not. Yeah. And um, did you, I, I, I remember you said something about um, I'm not sure if this was in the law reform report or whether it was just an example that you made up, but, you know, someone has gone to a therapist and said, oh, I'm, I'm a girl, but I want to be a boy. I think I'm a boy. I have gender dysphoria. And the therapist says back to the, the person, um, oh, we can fix that. I and think that was included in the TLRI report as an as a anecdote, yep. As an example of what conversion yep. therapy looks like. Yes, that's right. That's right. That is so pathetic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I'd just like to make a very quick comment about this from my own experience um, in relation to the COVID vaccines. Uh, I can remember going to see a doctor for the vaccine and um, I had struck out gender from the list and, and written in sex. Now, this particular doctor actually looked at me very cautiously and said, yes. <laughs> you know, so, you know, there's lots of medical professionals who realise what's going on here. Mm. But, um, you know, it's a, it's a bigger campaign of standing up to these, uh, these bullies and um, uh, social change agents who want to uh, upturn uh, a whole culture uh, around understanding yourself Sex as a class. Mm -hmm. um, now on, on to a different topic. Um, your activism for women's rights has um, affected your relationship with your daughter. Yes, that's right. Um, and I'd just like to say here that... Um, uh, next Tuesday on the 16th of June um, is an SBS Insight program uh, titled Sex, Politics and Religion. Uh, mm -hmm. It's actually about estrangement within families um, due to differing points of view um, on uh, sexual orientation and religion and gender identity. Um, uh, so just bear that in mind if you want to have a look at that. I, I was um, uh, very keen to give um, a perspective from our point of view about how the, the uh, TRA lobby operates because my daughter, uh, very sadly, is very much a 
TRA activist, um, even though she's um, married to a man uh, some three years ago and um, has had a changing range of identities, genders, I think. Um, but uh, just to go back a little bit um, to explain the situation with my daughter, um, she came home to live here, um, I think, about three and a half years ago in November 2019, came home with her partner to live in a studio I have on the property. And she came home to um, uh, help more on the property with me and her father who lives in the conjoined house here and to spend more time with us and uh, to save money so that she could uh, buy a house. After the first two weeks of her uh, being here in November, somebody notified me about a Facebook posting that she made um, in August. Um, so that was a couple of months before she actually moved back in here. Now, we had um, not been able to have a discussion about these issues. She was very um, typical of TRAs uh, when talking about these things. It was quite simply a matter of, I don't want to talk about it. Um, and if I raised anything with her in a very mild way, like what I was doing, for instance, she'd just say, you know, shut up, I don't want to know. And when it did become an issue that we could actually discuss something, she would raise it. And it would really be a point of that she got to saying, there should be no debate. There should be no debate. Um, so um, the Facebook posting, which I've actually just ma uh, put onto my Facebook page today for people to have a look at, because it follows the same pattern. And uh, it, it says this, I'll read it very briefly, if that's all right. Yeah, go for it. 12th of August. I want to make it 100% clear that I do not stand with my mother, Isla McGregor, and her friend and colleague, BW, in their transphobic, anti-trans, anti-sex worker beliefs and actions. And I condemn their poor quality, below the belt, personal and biased attacks on activists and members of the LGBTIQA plus community <clears throat> that are masters journalism, but are pure bigotry and discrimination. They are not defending free speech, they are defending hate speech. I love and honour my mother as my mother for many of the things she has done in her life, but on these issues we will never see eye to eye and I will always stand by my trans, NB and SW siblings in the struggle for their human rights. I will not use, and this is the part that's really amazing that, that indicates that we've got a cult here because this is about the determination of what language is to be used, who is to own it, and who is to control it. She goes on, I will not use the terms turf or swerve because I refuse to acknowledge the claim that people who are anti-trans or anti-sex worker are feminists in any way, let alone a radical one. I will not participate in the theft of the beautiful word radical by this toxic and oppressive movement. Mm. Oh, Isla, I'm so sorry. That, that's so frustrating to listen to. Yeah, sorry. Um, look, what, what's, what's sort of more important is that how, how the estrangement developed. So within about seven months, she left living here. She was married a couple of months before leaving. And by that stage, the hostility was very palpable. Um, I'm sure that there were things that I could have done better in my communication with her, that her father could have done better. Um, but, you know, the reality was that she was absolutely hard line about this. Um, you know, she was living on a property where I was working 24 seven <laughs> to, to try and bring to light this very oppressive and uh, harmful ideology. And it must have been very difficult for her, which it was. But during the time she was here, what, what is even more indicative about to what extent this ideology would push people within their families um, to damage that relationship. 
I posted um, something a couple of years before onto the Tasmanian Times website. And it was a photo of a naked male who had transed to female, um, long black hair, breasts, and genitals hanging out down below. And it was a post of uh, this man saying, um, I'm sick and tired of having to hide my body in, in, in the ladies' change room at the gym, so I'm going to come out and I'm just going to, you know, show off what I've got. After all, I have a right to do so. So I posted it on TasmanianTimes.com with a heading that said, coming to a women's gym near you. Now, just before she left here, my daughter told me that she had considered contacting the police to notify them about my posting and that I had no right to do it. This was a public posting. A Tasmanian Times, of course, uh, which used to be our great independent news free speech website, um, was sold out and uh, to a Green Party member here. That post has been removed. Um, uh, so even though it was, I believe, in the contract that all things would remain on the site, that one was removed. Mm. So she she went on as we the campaign ramped up here with Hobart City Council to publicly be supporting Jack's Fox attacks on myself, publicly supporting these things, um, and continuing to publicly support on Facebook and numerous media um, that. Um, you know, Jack, that, uh, just for, um, yeah. voices should not be heard. Yep. For anyone who doesn't know, Jax Fox is a female who identifies as non-binary and won herself a seat on Hobart City Council and has behaved, like, she's very immature the way that she's conducted herself. Mm. Mm. I think the important thing about a lot of people who are entrenched in this lobby um, is that uh, particularly in my daughter's case, who has a very good reputation in the theatre and drama arts arena here, is that there's no opportunity for you to dissent because if you do mm. dissent, that's the end of your career. Yeah. And yet, you know, I mean, my daughter was well aware of my background in advocating for whistleblowers, mm. um, like she said in her little uh, denunciation, you know, she supports all the work I've done. We agreed on all political issues except when it came down to to that uh, little raft of issues that encompass um, the commodification of women the erasure of women mm. and of course she um, uh, for, for her own reasons I um, it's beyond me um, has in my view been unable to do any critical analysis on this but when you're working in that arena there is an absolute imperative to self-censor and to uh, to um, not uh, go outside the tent. And I think that's it in summary. Mm. Uh, it's, um, it's just such a strange situation, it, like that, that to have so many people um, b believing that prostitution is good for yeah. women, to believe that rapists in women's prisons is good for mm -hmm. women, it's insane. It's, it's so backwards. Um, mm. um, and, and, you know, to, to, be, to be thinking that way, you've got to be brainwashed. Mm. It yes. does look like a cult. Yes. Um, and look, I'll, I'll let people know, I've, I've, I've been in some sort of weird cult-like things in my time. Um, I spent a, a good 10 years as a conspiracy theorist um the new age new cage mm. movement i was trapped in that for about 20 years and it wasn't until i had my early midlife crisis at around 35 years old that i was like oh my god it's all bullshit and um but you know prior to that no one could have convinced me otherwise so mm. i can understand sort of how how people get stuck in this way of thinking. And um, sadly, I, I, I really don't know how to wake them up out of it. it. 
it's something that each person I, I, I think has to come to alone on their own terms. You can't convince them out of it. I mean, I remember having ideological differences with my parents. Uh, my mum was actually uh, decided to join the Jehovah's Witnesses, but didn't last very long. Um, and, you know, we would have our falling out and some of them lasted months or even a couple of years. But we didn't, it wasn't fueled by the internet. It wasn't yeah. fueled by yeah. all this stuff. It was a personal thing that eventually ran its course through our, you know, our relationship. Now there's all these external influences and that would be difficult to navigate. But I also know that life is a great leveller and a lot of the things that I used to judge my parents about, mm -hmm. I now look back and both of them have been dead for a long time and I think, oh, my God, I so get your side. I so understand. And although I don't agree, I totally get it now and I'm so sorry. And I wish that I had have, um, you know, mended things sooner and you know i i just i just feel so awful for you isla that you know that hasn't happened yet and that there's all this external pressure yes. you know it's hard enough to navigate your relationship with your parents when you've got different views but yes. you know with all this media and everything else fueling it this cult-like yes. mentality it makes it so much harder and i'm so sorry I think um, the other thing I'd, I'd like to add here is about this um, demonisation. I mean, I, I always talk about the four Ds of the trans cult, um, demonisation, uh, denunciation, denial and disassociation. And this is happening to a lot of people and a lot of families. And so I'm talking about this because I want to raise this with my own experience to say this is happening to so many women I know with their brothers and their sisters and their uncles and their aunties and their children. This is a systemic estrangement un un unfolding in our society. And in the research on estrangement, um, what they're finding is that, uh, you know, sexual orientation and gender identity are two of the key reasons why there is estrangement. I think it's less and less becoming sexual orientation and gender identity is ramping up. And um, the other thing is that it, it, in part of the disassociation process that my, my daughter uh, put me through, she also disassociated from her father on the basis that he actually agreed with me. But it's how she did that that was really interesting because in demonising people um, who have different point of view to you, usually, and this is what we see with journalists like Kenji Sato as well, what they do is they dredge up something in the past, they use some quote out of context, they revisit some unresolved uh, difficulty which you've previously thought was resolved and had lovely tearful mother-daughter sessions with, and they throw them back at you again and um, a gaslight you. So um, I think this, this whole psychological process of being in a cult is, is, is really very easily to pinpoint each step as it goes through. And I think, you know, the more journalists who become aware of what is happening within families on this issue, the more maybe they'll begin to realise that, that uh, particularly people like Kenji Sato, that it's, it's how you report on these issues from both sides in a fair and impartial way, in the same way that in family conflicts, you have to be able to be open, to listen to the other point of view. You can come to a, a nice position of agreeing to disagree. But when you get this, this level of hatred, which uh, you know I've experienced from my daughter, this absolute shutting down and these uh, horrendous slurrings, you know, you, you've got no chance. You have to walk away. You have to reach a level of detachment and understanding that you can't change this, no matter whether you've been to a council or not. Um, you can't change this. As you say, Angela, they have to come to it through their own realisation. And in due course, my daughter will. But unfortunately, at my age, I may not see that. Mm. Wow, yeah, yeah. I don't know what to say to that. It's, it's a right. mess. It's just, it's an absolute mess. Um, and, and 
it's yeah. not like Isla's ill-informed. Like Isla, you're very, you know, you're an intelligent woman. You're reasoned. You're you're rational. You've come to these conclusions because you're highly educated. It's not like, you know, you're not telling the truth. This is the sad thing about it. Well, everybody has their own truth, and I'm sure my daughter feels that she has her own truth. Mm. Um, but the thing is that, uh, you know, we still can't get but get past the Judith Butler <laughs> stuff, you know, and we can't get past the financial imperatives. I mean, this happens with all whistleblowers, you know, that uh, and as I keep saying, the gender critical movement and the ethical health movement on these issues is the biggest mass whistleblowing movement we've seen in recent times. Yeah. It's huge. Yeah. And and as I keep saying, people like Kenji Sato and the editors of the Mercury hopefully will one day be held accountable for withholding from the public, in the public interest, major health issues that are a global health scandal. How how has the Mercury reported on the TAS Law Reform Institute's report? Uh, the Mercury has failed to uh, get back to three gender critical organisations: the Coalition, uh, Active Watchful Waiting, and LGB Defence. Uh, they both sent in. They all sent in, as you know, Stasha, um, op eds. They sent in media releases this week. How did the Mercury react to that? like they always react and like the ABC mm. will react. They only interviewed the faith-based groups so that they could further demonise and polarise the debate into a debate that only religious bigots, um, you know, will oppose this conversion legislation. Mm. And they misreported the religious lobby in both articles. Mm. So, I mean, this is just appalling. Uh, it's very frustrating watching this happen. Um, yeah. Could... They're no platform and silence us because they don't have any arguments. And we all know that on a personal mm. level and on a media level. Well, they but... also don't want to, to um, publicise the facts as we see them because mm. the average uh, Jill and Joe blogs, when they read the facts <laughs> as we see them, will go, yeah. That mm. makes sense. Mm. Yeah. 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 I had someone say to me um, yesterday, um, an old friend I haven't spoken to for ages, she said, um, I didn't know any of this was happening until I saw your Twitter. Huh. And I'm like, yep. If I had five cents for every time someone said that to me. <laughs> so, you know, we've become the news. Yes. Yes. It's bizarre. But it's, yes. how scary is that? That you know, we, we now have bur bear the burden of responsibility for educating the public what's actually going on. Yes, that's right. And, mm. and I mean, journalists like Kenji Sato, um, uh, unwittingly, uh, the more vile and, and uh, you know, uh, pernicious his journalism, the more people he's speaking. And they're mm. coming to look at the coalition, the coalition sites and yep. they're Googling our names. And they're seeing what we've got on our Facebook pages and our Twitter feeds and things like this. And we know that this is happening, and particularly since the election with Kath Dees, um, we know that the TRA lobby are ramping up their campaign because they're getting very worried because more and more people are coming peeped through the, um, the sport issue, um, that photo of the two men on the podiums with the one woman holding the baby was a, was a magnificent stroke of... Uh, you know, uh, genius in terms of winning our campaign. And, of course, parents are just becoming absolutely outraged in Tasmania, you know, in Tasmania. I'm constantly hearing uh, from parents who are saying, oh, my trans, my, my child came home from school and they trans yesterday and, you know, help. Yeah. <laughs> and, of course, they're finding the coalition website and they're saying, gee, I'm so relieved that we've finally got some factual medical resources uh, that we can actually better understand these issues instead of capitulating to the to the you know the tantrums and the the threats of suicide from children who are going through puberty mm. 
Well, Isla, we better wrap it up there. But look, thank you so much for coming on again. It's good to see you. Um, nice to see you both. Insightful and um, thoughtful as ever. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Angela, and thank you, Stasha. Thank you. All right. See you next time. Bye bye. 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 Well, uh, yes. Oh, see, I don't have my mum, and mum and I had a, you know, an awkward relationship. But um, it makes me so sad when people have got their mums and they don't, you know, make an effort to keep in touch. It just breaks my heart. I do, you know, my mum was a rat bag, but I'd do anything to have her back. Yeah, um, yeah it's just so sad. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Look, I was estranged from my parents, my mother in particular um for I think about two years and mm. um what trick prompted me to get back in touch was um the realization that if they if one of them died and I had left things like that mm. I would regret it forever yeah I mean, even when I couldn't stand my parents, I still kept in touch with them to check how they were and all that stuff. I did live on the other side of the country, but, you know, yeah. Yeah. It's sad. Mm. Um, I had an interesting experience this morning. My kid was playing um, Roblox. That's all right. And she said, she said, oh, I've got to choose a pronoun. And I looked over and said, What? And she said, oh, Roblox, which is a game that is aimed at seven to 13-year-olds, and it was some, um, what's it called? Adopt Me, where it's aimed at seven to 13-year-olds and you can adopt pets and collect pets. Um, and yet the kids had to choose a pronoun pin to put on their dog's collar, right? And so it's indoctrinating kids that age to think about what these pronouns mean. Yeah. And my son, who's 11, goes, why are they telling kids to decide their sexuality? Mm -hmm. Because That's it had all the, you know, asexual and pan and non-binary and gay, lesbian, whatever. And I said, good point, mate. Grooming. Grooming. 100%. So, yeah. Seven to 13s. And my daughter just picked any old one and stuck it on her pet and kept moving through the game. Um, yeah. No, they've, um, they've, they've really indoctrinated this generation. I, I'm not sure this generation is going to wake up from it. Oh, I think a lot of kids, um, particularly my kids' age group, are, you know, are onto it because my 13-year-old my came home and said, oh, one of the girls in my um, grades just cut all their hair off and started wearing the boys' uniform and says it changed her name. And I said, oh, yeah, is she um, non-binary now? She goes, yeah, you know. <laughs> and it was like, mm, yeah, it was boredom almost. Okay. So, well, that's good. Yeah, may, maybe I'm uh, uh, catastrophizing um, because I have also said in the past that I think when when kids when this becomes uncool for the mm. kids then we'll we'll see some serious change remember five years ago people were getting like sleeve tattoos and stuff yeah you know and just getting covered and covered in tats yeah that's like with the kids now you know yeah. the odd tattoo here and there is okay but you know people are getting this massive amount of tats and now it's considered quite like outdated and those poor people <laughs> like you know full like dragons down their arms and stuff and you know some people are okay with that but some people um are quite self-conscious now that all the us old people that said you're going to regret that that they're starting to have it come in and go oh you know missing out on maybe modeling jobs and stuff like that because five years ago it will get your work now the clean skins are back in mm -mm, yeah. not cool and I, I do think you know because we know this gender thing is a social contagion there is a degree of that already and, you know, I know a, a fair few younger people because of the age of my children. And there is a like, no, nah, yeah, the trans thing's been done to death. And because when you're seeing people your parents' age or all the popular television programs, like um, I saw that uh, The Apprentice had a trans, like a drag queen on it, in with the women, um, you know, when you're seeing the mainstream take on this stuff and all these companies that are supporting Pride, Kids don't, don't, it's not cool. That's not punk. That's not groovy. The old groovy, that's an old person's word, but it's just not, you know. So I think there is a degree of um, cynicism 
amongst the young people about this thing. That's good. That's yeah. That's encouraging. All right. Well, fingers crossed. Yeah. All right. We better finish off. But um, thank you to our subscribers. Yeah. And uh, a message for all the um, journalists and trans activists that are mining this channel for content. Can you please credit us? <laughs> like if we're going to be on the news or mentioned in your articles and you're going to be watching, you know, video after video looking for, you know, things Trash. to talk about. Yeah. Or you're going to slag off my friend here. Um, could you please at least say, you know, their YouTube channel, Turf Talk, or their Twitter, or just, you know, give a source. Be professional. Yeah, write the words, Turf Talk Down Under. Yep. Please like, share, subscribe if you haven't already, and thank you. We'll see you again next week. Yeah, see ya. <laughs>